Well, good morning, if you will. Let's all turn in our Bibles to 1 John. Believe it or not, we've already finished another book of the Bible. 1 John, the last chapter, which is chapter 5. This series on Thanksgiving and what to be thankful for has been really good through 1 John. He, he tells us a lot of things about Christ, about love. And today, the title of the sermon is, We Should Be Thankful for God's Commands. We should be thankful for God's commands. There are many things each and every one of us have to be thankful for. But, if I were to ask, Rhetorically, how many of us really, really like obeying commands? There's probably not too many of us that would raise our hands, right? Uh, you know, my kids learned a valuable lesson a couple of weeks ago. Me and Gina got this nice little letter in the mail from the city of Hickson, Tennessee, where we were running behind for an appointment, and they sent us a nice little speeding ticket. Do what? Red light. Yeah, oh, red light. Yeah, running the red light. Or yellow light, whichever one you want to call it. But, you know, that is a command set forth by our government. We are supposed to obey commands. So we got to teach the kids that, yes, even mom and dad have consequences when we break commands, when we break the law. So if you all would this morning, let's all stand for the reading of God's Word because God's Word is inerrant. God's Word is infallible, and God's Word is inspired. 1 John chapter 5, verses 1 through 4. John writes this, Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the Father also loves the one born of Him. This is how we know that we love God's children. When we love God and obey His commands. For this is what love for God is. To keep His commands. And His commands are not a burden. Because everyone who has been born of God conquers the world. This is the victory that has conquered the world. Our faith. Brother Andy, if you would, would you open us up in prayer? Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day, and I thank you for this opportunity to open up your word today, Father, to uh, learn more, to glean from it, Father, and to uh, just to worship your worship you this morning, Father. And Lord, I ask that you just uh, be with us this morning. Open our open our ears that we may hear. Open our hearts that we might receive the blessing. Lord, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 In verse 1, John writes, Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ. You know, I remember when I was a little guy in Sunday school, it, it really freaked me out because I thought that was Jesus' last name. Because we always said that, right? right? Jesus Christ. But Christ means the anointed one. The Messiah. Anyone who believes that Jesus is the Messiah has been born of God. And this is how we know that we love God's children when we love God and obey His commands. The first thing we're going to look at is we should obey God's commands. As believers, and remember, I've said this multiple times, John's writing to believers. He's writing to me, he's writing to you if you're saved. As believers, we should obey God's commands. A person who obeys God's commands is doing what is right, both towards God and towards their brothers and sisters in Christ. Let that sink in. A person who obeys God's commands is doing what is right, both towards God and towards other believers. Church, I can't make it any more clear than my opening statement. 
We should obey God's commands. And I'm not going to get off on a rant, but I will say this. One of God's commands is the gathering with other believers. He commands us to do that. Why? Because we need that. I need to be around my brothers and sisters in Christ. I don't know how other people think that they don't. God commands us to do multiple things. John tells us that God's commands are not a burden. Now, I like that. Sometimes we see commands as burdens and restrictions and, and joy killers and, and different things, but John says not that, it's not that way with God. God's commands are not a burden because everyone who has been born of God conquers the world. Now, think about that. Everyone who has been born of God conquers the world. He tells us, this is the victory that has conquered the world, our faith. Now let that sink in. We're not going to conquer this world with sword, with tank, with nuclear weapon. How do we conquer this world? John tells us with our faith. Too many times we don't see spiritual warfare the way we should. Spiritual warfare is real. Those of us that have lost loved ones, you know it isn't a game. But if you're like me, as soon as you read that sentence, you probably thought of one of them old hymns. And I wrote it down here. Listen to the words. Encamped along the hills of light, ye Christian soldiers rise and press the battle ere the night shall veil the glowing skies. Against the foe in veils below, let all of our strength be hurled. Faith is the victory we know that overcomes the world. Faith is the victory. Faith is the victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. This morning, I honestly don't know what each and every one of you are going through. But I do know that it takes faith to get through some of our hard times. We've got to rely upon God. You know... In all honesty, there comes time in each and every one of our lives when that's all we've got. David is the chief sinner, talking about me, when it comes to wanting to be a fixer. When something goes wrong, I want to fix it. I'm just built that way, and most of you probably are as well. But you know what? There's things that's happened in my life that I couldn't fix. I had to rely upon the Lord and my faith in Him. I've said it already three times in the sermon, but as believers we should obey God's commands. This isn't an option. It's not like we get to pick and choose. Jesus, it's pretty clear in the Scripture that his apostles, his disciples called him master. It's written in the scripture that he's the king of kings. It's written in scripture that he's the Lord of lords. So how dare I try to negotiate with the king of kings? When the king gives you a command, you obey it without hesitation. We should obey those in authority over us. But if we're honest, none of us like this. I tell this jokingly, but you know, there's always a little bit of truth behind the joke. I, I tell people that uh, I, got a, I got a spanking every other day at school. And the days I didn't, my dad did. <laughs> you know, I, I thought I was a pretty good kid, but looking back on it, you know, 
I, I don't think I was one of those kids that liked to obey the rules too much. But as kids, you have an authority figure over you, which is your parents. Students have an authority figure over them, which is their teacher. Employees have an authority figure over them, which is their boss. Nobody gets away from this. Everybody in this world is accountable to somebody else. And ultimately, as believers, we are accountable to God. God is the ultimate authority figure over us. And sometimes this is a struggle. And sometimes, I'll, I'll, I'll be honest, I, I've had people come to me, well, you know, the Bible says to do this, this, and this, but what about this? And they'll give me a theoretical situation. And if it goes against Scripture, you can ultimately put Scripture as the ultimate authority. I've had, I've had mothers come to me and say, you know, my husband doesn't like me to come to church. Should I still come to church and bring the kids? I'm like, that's what the Scripture says to do. And as a pastor, I don't like telling people to go against their spouse. But you can't put your spouse above God. This is a hard struggle we have sometimes. And I'm not going to pretend it's not. But I think, according to John and according to other scriptures, we can agree that God is the ultimate authority and we should obey God's commands. But not only that, John goes on to write, the second thing we're going to look at this morning, is we should believe God's testimony. We should believe God's testimony. Let's look at verses 5 through 13. John writes, Who is the one who conquers the world but the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? Jesus Christ, He is the one who came by water and blood. Not by water only, but by water and by blood. And the Spirit is the one who testifies because the Spirit is the truth. For these are three that testify, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three are in agreement. If we accept human testimony, God's testimony is greater. Because it is God's testimony that He has given about His Son. The one who believes in the Son of God has this testimony within himself. The one who does not believe God has made him a liar. Because he has not believed in the testimony God has given about his son. And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life and this life is in his son. The one who has the son has life. The one who does not have the son of God does not have life. I have written these things to you who believe in the name of the son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. Back in John's day, we got to realize, there was a great heresy going around the local church. And John was battling this. So John writes, uh, who's the one that conquers the world? The one that believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus Christ, He's the one that came by water and blood. Uh, both of those things. And the Spirit's the one that testifies. The heresy going around, being taught in the local church, um, stated that only the earthly Jesus died. No, take a moment. Meaning that Jesus' divine nature was separated from Him before He went to the cross. Let that sink in. That's a lot. So let me boil that down. What the local church was teaching, and John's having to correct them, is that God can't die. So Jesus was born of God, lived a sinless life, but when it got time to go to the cross, His divine nature left Him and only the earthly Jesus died. John argues here that Jesus came by water, which was His baptism. His divine nature, the Holy Spirit, came upon Him. Jesus was sinless. He came by water. And John says this Jesus came by blood, meaning His death. Jesus 
must have been God and sinless to atone for our sins. Let that sink in. David can't do nothing for you. I'm a sinful person like every other person that was born. But Jesus, because of His divine nature, came, was born, was baptized, was killed, and was resurrected and ascended to the Father to atone for all the sin of humanity. That's what John is telling us here. This Jesus came by water and by blood and the Holy Spirit that descended upon Him in His baptism testifies to these things. John adds that that Spirit tells us that everything He said so far is true. The Spirit of God descended upon Jesus' baptism and when Jesus left, remember He told His apostles, He said, Guys, I've got to go. But I'm going to send someone else. I'm going to send you a comforter. On the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came in like a rushing wind and filled all of the believers. And ever since then, if you've been saved, that same Holy Spirit has came into you. And that's what John's telling us. He's like, guys, I was there. I've seen these things. I've been filled by the Spirit. And if you're a believer, your spirit will testify that the things that John is writing is true. So basically, the man who died upon the cross had been baptized in the eyes of God, died a horrific death and shed his blood for all of humanity and had the Holy Spirit of God and dwelling in Him. So yes, we should believe God's testimony. And this is God's testimony. This is the gospel. And I'll repeat it again quickly. That Jesus was born of a virgin, led a sinless life, died for all of humanity, was resurrected and ascended to the right hand of the Father. That is the good news. Next week we're going to start a Christmas sermon series. You know, I don't know about you, but I've seen it many years so far in the local churches. You know, we, 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 we see Easter way up here. And we kind of see Christmas as under it. You know, But yet, you've got to put them here. Without the virgin birth, the death, the resurrection, Easter would mean nothing. So the birth of Jesus is so important to the gospel. This sinless birth. If you're sitting here this morning, John assures you that the one who died for you is all God And all man. Jesus had two natures. He was all God. Yet. He was all man. You know I'll be honest. I appreciate the fact. That Jesus was all man. I appreciate the fact that Jesus wept. That Jesus hungered. That Jesus had a holy wrath about him sometimes when people were taken advantage of. So what does this second point mean for me and you? That we should believe God's testimony. The last five minutes of what John has told us should encourage and burden each and every one of us sitting here this morning, to leave here today and share our faith with others. If we we truly believe that this Jesus was God and died for our sins, how could we not share it with others? And I'm talking about our lost loved ones, not even strangers. 
And I've used this illustration before, and you'll probably hear it a ten dozen times. But, you know, I heard it one time when I was little, and it stuck with me. How many of us, if we were to see a four- or five-year-old child that really didn't know any better, say they were two or three, and they were leaving our church at the front doors, and they were walking down that little sidewalk by themselves, and you've seen a big, massive 18-wheeler barreling down this road, there's not a one of us that wouldn't run and try to grab that little toddler. But yet, people that don't know any better walk right by us every day heading towards death, that big 18-wheeler, and we don't even open our mouths. We should believe God's testimony. Our last point this morning. We should seek God in prayer. We should seek God in prayer. I'm going to read the rest of the chapter, which is verse 14 through 21. This is the confidence we have before Him. If we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And if we know that He hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we have asked of Him. If anyone sees a fellow believer committing a sin that doesn't, lead to, that doesn't lead to death, he should ask, and God will give life to him. To those who commit sin that doesn't lead to death, there is a sin that leads to death. I am not saying he should pray about that. All unrighteousness is sin. And there is sin that doesn't lead to death. We know that everyone who has been born of God does not sin. But the one who is born of God keeps him, and the evil one does not touch him. We know that we are of God, and the whole world is under the sway of the evil one. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know the true one. We are in the true one, that is, in His Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. Little children, guard yourselves from idols. John lets us know that if we ask anything according to the will of God, He hears us. Again, he's writing to believers, so he's telling us that if you're saved, that if we pray for God's will, God hears us. And that's good news. Remember, that's part of the model prayer. Jesus seeks the Father's will. Not not my will, but your will be done. When we pray, we must seek the will of God and not our own selfish needs and desires. Have you ever thought about what if God truly gave you everything you prayed for? What a mess we would really be in. Where would would we really be where we're at right now in our lives? I don't think so. I think God knows better. John warns us that sometimes a Christian sins so seriously that God judges that sin with swift and severe judgment. John says there is sin unto death. Now... We don't know what that is because I think that's different for everybody and everything going on. That's up to God. God is holy. God's the judge. He decides what sin is punishable by death. Do we see this? Absolutely we see this. Let's go back in the Bible. Some of you that are scholarly may remember two people in the Bible named uh, Ananias and Sapphira. At that point in the local church, God told them to do certain things. uh, And Ananias and Sapphira refused. Deliberately disobeyed God and God's commands. And guess what? God dropped them dead on their doorstep. Now, some of us may not like that. I don't like that. 
But like I said, I'm not God. I'm not the ultimate judge. God is. God has His reasons for things. But we do see in Scripture there is sin punishable by death. And if you want to go read that, that's in Acts chapter 5. Ananias and Sapphira. If a Christian sins and it does not lead to death, guess what? This is about prayer. John says we are to pray for that believer. We are to pray for that person. Now, sometimes we do the opposite. Sometimes, you've heard that old saying, we kick somebody when they're down. Too many times instead of praying for someone, we judge them, we belittle them, we shame, 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 shame them. Now, we don't condone the sin, right? As a believer and as a gathering of believers, we call the local church. We don't condone sin. But, we have responsibilities as children of God to pray for people that fall into sin with the ultimate goal of reconciling them back to God. That is the ultimate goal. There have been... You guys, I'm not saying nothing you don't know is true. I've only been here four months, but you guys have been here much longer than me. You know there are people that should be in these pews that have gone astray. Our job is to reach out to them, to show them love, and to get them back here so they can be reconciled back to God. In saying that, let's take it a step further. There is a sin that leads to death. If it doesn't lead to death, we're to pray for them, trying to reconcile them back. But we must remember that all, A-L-L, all sin leads to death. All sin leads to death. Paul writes in Romans 6, 23, For the wages of sin is death. No ifs, ands, and buts about it. That is the wages of sin. That is why Paul writes this to get us to open our eyes and see that if we don't do something about this sin, we're going to be judged one day. And the judgment of sin, the wages of sin is death. Paul wasn't trying to be ugly. Paul was trying to get us to open our eyes and realize that if we don't do something about our sin... Death is crouching at the door. So, what do we know? For the wages of sin is death, but the second part of that verse is even better. It says, but, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Okay, so the wages of sin is death. But we have eternal life through Jesus Christ. That's the good news. We're sitting here talking about Thanksgiving. And you can probably tell by looking at me, I love to eat come Thursday. But, I would much, I would be more thankful to see my lost loved ones come to the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is something we can be thankful for. We can be thankful for our own salvation. There's not one sitting here that saved who wasn't on a beeline towards a literal, eternal, burning hell. We should be thankful for our salvation. We should be thankful that God loved us so much in our sin that He died for us. Now something unusual. John's talking about this and talking about this and talking about this. And then he gets to the last verse and says this. Little children, guard yourselves from idols. Now, I don't know about you, but if, say I was a, a, a professor, I, I, would, I would give John a, a, an automatic C right there because he broke his train of thought. That's not a very good essay because he's writing a letter, right? But I think John has that for a specific reason. He's dealing with commands. He's dealing with prayer. And then he's like, church, listen, guard yourselves from idols. Why? Because if we don't, our prayer lives will suffer. 
If we don't, we won't obey God's commands. If we don't, we won't be what we need to be as ambassadors for the Lord Jesus Christ. So it's kind of an amend of there. He's kind of saying, guys, I told you all of these things, but you got to guard yourself from idols. Why would he write that? Because he knows David suffers from idolatry. John knows that probably most of you suffer from idolatry. I've seen this definition in my studies. It says this. An idol can be defined as any moral compromise with worldly perspectives. Any moral compromise with worldly perspectives. And that's a lot better than I can write. This is the way I would put it. I define an idol as anything that someone places ahead of God. Anything someone places ahead of God. Now, we know the bad things, right? You shouldn't place this ahead of God. You shouldn't place this ahead of God. But what about the good things in our lives? See, that's where we miss the mark sometimes. I've got a list here. You know, what about... Well, the biggest one's money, right? People think money's evil. Money's not evil. Money's not good. It's what we do with money that makes it evil or good. What about children, grandchildren? Those are good things. But we can't place them ahead of God. What about our jobs? Some of you are tired. Some of us are still working. Jobs are not evil. Jobs are not good. Jobs provide an income. We shouldn't put jobs ahead of God. What about our spouse? That's a hard one. But I told you guys, if I were to put Gina ahead of God, I'd be the worst husband to her because I'd be putting her somewhere she shouldn't be. I can't put my wife ahead of God. When I put God first, I am a better father. When I put God first, I am a better employee. When I put God first, I am a better husband. You can plug in any blank you want to. When you put God first, you are in His will. This morning, if you don't know, we've been talking about prayer on Sunday nights. And one thing I've discovered is prayer is a spiritual discipline discipline that we all struggle with in different facets. Today, we all need to be in prayer. There's not a one of us here who doesn't have a prayer need. I don't know what yours is specifically, but... I do know this is a time of thanksgiving. Why don't we pray for those that are less fortunate? It don't have to be financially. You guys have heard me say it. I could name a handful of people already that that want to be here this morning, but can't physically. We call them shut-ins. We call them different things. One of these days, we may be shut-ins. We need to pray for those shut-ins. We need to pray for the leaders of Oak Street Baptist Church. We need to pray for our members of Oak Street Baptist Church. You all need to pray for your pastor. I pray for you. I don't know what's going on in your lives, but I do know that God wants us to obey His commands And in all humility, come to Him in prayer. This morning, as I was reading these scriptures, you may have realized you don't know Jesus. You've not accepted Jesus as your personal Savior. What a day to come. What a day to be thankful and accept the Lord Jesus as your personal Savior. This morning, you may have realized that you may not have committed sin unto death, but maybe you're living in some sin you shouldn't be living in. Today is a good day to repent of that sin and rededicate yourself 
back to the service of the Lord Jesus Christ. Some of you may have lost loved ones that you need to come pray for. I don't know your needs, but I do know we serve a God that wants to hear our needs. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I do love You. Lord, I do thank You. Lord, I ask that You be with each and every one of us today. Father, be with the service tonight as we gather and we feast and remember You and are thankful for You. Lord, if there's someone out there that doesn't know You, give them the boldness and courage to step out. God, we would just love to rejoice with them this morning. For it's in the precious and holy name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen.